Um, so welcome to the second in a series of luncheons uh, that are sponsored by the Campaign to End Unwanted Medical Treatment uh, and its collaborating organizations. So I'm Larry Atkins. I'm the president of the National Academy of Social Insurance. Um, and it's my pleasure today to act as the moderator for this lunch. And uh, I do that for all of these lunches, I guess. Um, and um, to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Just to, before we get started with that, I just want to mention a few things. The, uh, the objective of the campaign to end unwanted medical treatment is, uh, is quite simple. It's to ensure all patients' dignity by honoring their wishes, goals, uh, values, and preferences. Nothing more and uh, nothing less. So the National Academy is, is proud to be a member of this collaborative effort, um, and it's our great pleasure today to be able to introduce one of our most distinguished members as a speaker. Um, and uh, on your, in your uh, packet, you'll find a paper from the last uh, session that we had, the white paper. The Academy is uh, producing a white paper after each of these uh, sessions, and they'll be distributed. Our first lunch in December, we heard from uh, Dr. Bud, Bud Hammes, the Director of Medical Humanities um, and uh, Gunderson Health System at Gunderson Health System in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Hammes designed and implemented the innovative, highly successful advanced care planning model known as Respecting Choices which places the person at the very center of decision making. And as we heard in December, um, Dr. Hammes managed to redirect and inspire the work of a major health care provider, the Gunderson Health System, toward what uh, we would all want for ourselves and our families, a system that respects our choices, uh, whether we want all the treatments available, none of the treatments available, or something in between. Um, with innovative and successful models developing every day around the country, a better political environment for the issue here in Washington, and our realization that advanced illness and end-of-life care is a critical piece of the long-term care puzzle, clearly this is a very exciting time for the issue of person-centered advanced illness care. And I can say, uh, having uh, served at the end of last year as the staff director of the Commission on Long-Term Care, um, that we, we really have part of the solution uh, for long-term care near our grasp if we can better ensure that uh, people understand their options and get the care they want at the right time. So with that said, I want to acknowledge the growing list of national partners for the campaign. Um, and uh, I imagine their list is in your packets, right, of all the partners. Um, but I'd also like to thank the Consumer Coalition for Quality Health Care, the Elder Justice Coalition, and Compassion and Choices for financially supporting both the uh, paper and the lunches. So uh, let's get started. I, I don't think there's anyone in the room who's not aware of or at least has benefited from the innumerable contributions that uh, Dr. Bruce Vladek has made to creating a better health care system for millions of Americans. Dr. Vladek is currently a senior advisor at Nexera Incorporated, a leading global healthcare consulting firm. But prior to Nexera, you may have known him as the administrator of the Healthcare Financing Administration, what they called it before it was known as the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, under President Clinton between 1993 and 1997, um, and that was a time that was marked by the Balanced Budget Act, significant innovation in statewide Medicaid programs, major initiatives to combat fraud and abuse, development of the Medicare prospective payment systems, um, implementation of the first quantitative quality measures for Medicare plans, and a lot more. Or you may know him as the presidential appointee to the National Bipartisan Commission on the Future of Medicare, or perhaps as the Senior Vice President for Policy and Professor of Health and Geriatrics at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Well, you may know him as the President of the United Hospital Fund in New York, where he served for over 10 years. But today, we will hear from uh, Dr. Vladek, who has spearheaded a now three-year effort funded by the SCAN Foundation, known as 
uh, dignity-driven decision-making. According to a health affairs brief published by Dr. Vladek and Aaron Westfall of the SCAN Foundation in 2012, dignity-driven decision-making builds on previous efforts to define and develop patient and family-centered care for those with advanced illness. More a framework than a rigid structure, the dignity-driven the dignity decision-making model emphasizes the centrality of a collaborative process in which patients, their families, and clinicians work together continuously to define the goals of care and how best to implement them. That said, we're delighted to have Dr. Vladek with us here today to share with us more about this important initiative and share his views on person-centered advanced care, advanced illness care uh, that honors the wishes, goals, values, and preferences. Dr. Vladek. Uh, thanks very much, Larry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, one always starts off these kinds of things by saying I'm really glad to be here, but I'm really glad to be here. There were um, a number of times during the last couple of hours when I doubt um, whether I, I'd ever um, arrive, and I really want to um, apologize um, <clears throat> especially to, um, um, to our, uh, um, our host today for uh, adding some... Uh, unnecessary drama, to, but I hope it means that all of you got to have extra brownies um, in the course of it, so um, I won't feel uh, quite as badly except for uh, poor uh, Brian and Andy who are sort of um, watching the uh, clock all the time. I do want to talk today about uh, dignity-driven decision-making and some of the work um, we've been doing at the SCAN Foundation. I need to um, um, acknowledge um, their support of everything um, I'm going to be talking about today, but I also, um, we went back and forth and round and round on whether we should have copies of our deathless um, article that Aaron Westfall and I had in Health Affairs um, in uh, 2012 about this subject um, and uh, decided not to mess with uh, copyright issues, actually. But um, um, you can all um, find it and um, particularly recommended <coughs> Um, if, you're, um, if you're having trouble one night and beset by all kinds of anxiety and so forth and can't sleep, if you take it with a glass of warm milk, it will be um, extremely um, helpful under those circumstances um, and, um, and, possibly, um, and possibly others. Um, I want to do um, a particularly, well, I'm from New York, so you may expect this, but a particularly sort of um, gauche and probably inappropriate thing as a way of starting off and take um, a little bit of issue with our sponsors whose work I think is wonderful um, and wonderfully um, important and whose goals are, um, are impossible to, um, to argue with. But I'm not sure that defining the issue as one of unwanted medical treatment <clears throat> um, really gets um, to the full problem or really communicates the right message to people. Having lived myself through debates um, over a mandatory administration of um, the full drug um, regimen to patients with multidrug resistant tuberculosis um, in the early 90s, having lived like all of us through the endless debates over mandatory treatment for people with certain psychiatric um, disorders, um, <clears throat> um, I'm a little bit nervous of the concept of unwanted uh, medical treatment always being inappropriate. Um, I am also think that there is, um, and particularly in, in certain policy circles, not any of those in which I would include any of you, a notion that things are substantially more clear-cut um, than they are, and a, a notion built into the American public policy process by all the economists who run everything that everybody all the time throughout their life can be treated as though they're a rational consumer, and if you just give them enough information, uh, they will make a decision uh, reflecting their consumer sovereignty, when in fact the issue for many people um, with advanced illness, um, not to mention many people with lesser illnesses is they have no idea what they want. And even after the <clears throat> um, alternatives are explained to them and some of the implications of the alternatives are explained to them, in those rare instances, they're still not entirely sure of 
what they want. And I won't describe to you in gory detail my um, experience at my dentist yesterday morning other than to say um, that my very good dentist, who I like and trust very much, told me that um, relative to a problem they identified yesterday, I have three options, um, none of which was um, appealing to me in the slightest, um, but there were only sort of three appropriate things to do. And I said, well, what if I do nothing until the next time I come back? And she said, well, you might have a problem. I said, and then I can go to the oral surgeon and get the teeth pulled anyway, and the tooth pulled anyway. And she said, no, you can. And I said, generally, I can get an appointment with him in 24 to 48 hours. And she said, yes, generally, you can. I said, I'll see you in three months. But um, <clears throat> my wife is um, my resident dental consultant, and we discussed the issue for perhaps half an hour at dinner last night. And she has clear views as to which of the three alternatives I should, um, I should um, choose. Um, but. Uh, I like the idea of doing nothing, as I like it in many circumstances. Um, actually, when I was in the government, we never acknowledged we were doing nothing. We described it as proactive inactivity. Um, <laughs> but in this instance, at least, it seems to be um, a very satisfying um, strategy. Um, and I also want to, um, again, raise the issue in terms of nomenclature, um, that despite um, the fact that more people are signing up for health insurance under the ACA than um, um, anyone, um, than many of us expected. Not, this is the first time in history um, CBO may have gotten a projection accurate. Um, the fact is there are still an awful lot of Americans, even those with insurance cards, <coughs> who um, want certain kinds of medical treatment, which is clinically appropriate uh, for their needs and their circumstances, who can't get it for one reason or um, another. So I would say, and I know it's very hard to put it in an appropriate phrase, that what we really want to do um, is um, change a system in which some people get care they don't want and some people want care um, and need care and don't get it. And um, those mismatches on both ends of the spectrum and sort of in the middle um, are, um, are very substantial. Um, and we have a very long way to go um, in addressing them. Um, while I'm on nomenclature being um, and um, being sort of uh, pedantic about um, some of this stuff, um, I really got um, sort of a shiver of uh, dismay when Larry read that part from our paper talking about models of care because um, even then, but increasingly since, I've gotten very wary of the whole notion of models. And I think um, there's um, a great fascination uh, with the notion that if you could just find the right model of care somewhere um, and plug it into a particular problem, whether it's the provision of primary care through medical homes or a model for managing transitions between uh, home and back to the community, um, or a model for dealing with uh, care of advanced illness, or a model for this, you would solve um, all of um, your problems. And I think if you go out and look at successful healthcare delivery programs, um, of any particular kind, you'll find that um, there is considerable variation from one site to the next, um, and that one size uh, doesn't fit all. Um, and then, on the other hand, in those places where we have, as a matter of public policy, been most rigid about the models of care um, we've um, uh, incorporated into policy, um, we've um, locked ourselves into uh, very narrow boxes um, of one kind or another. The prototype where I have a sense of particular personal um, culpability and particular uh, personal involvement is the, um, is the evolution and now incorporation into public policy and into widespread but not very substantial um, impact of PACE programs um, for uh, care of um, of frail, um, uh, um, elderly, um, and I hope soon um, non-elderly disabled persons. Um, because what happened was we had very good models uh, starting at Onlock in San Francisco with some replication programs in the 1980s, and we wrote a statute and then implementing regulations that took that model in great detail. And so as of today, um, what is it? Uh, 16 years, 17 years, 16 plus, after the enactment of the Balanced Budget Act made PACE a, 
a part of the Medicare benefit package and an optional benefit for the states. Uh, we have 102 programs um, around the country, but among them they have fewer than 35,000 enrollees. Um, and we haven't been able to build it beyond that in part because we don't know what parts of the model are critical to the success. We've never disaggregated it. We've never looked at particular pieces. It's been an all or nothing thing. And as an all or nothing thing, it's very hard to run a program that has more than 300 enrollees unless you build enrollment in sort of multiples of 300. And the largest in the country are just a couple of thousand people when there are hundreds of thousands or millions of Americans who are by demographic and clinical characteristics um, eligible um, for that benefit. I think we've run into a little bit of the same problem, um, maybe for different reasons, with um, the uh, CMS um, ACL now, not AOA, a demonstration on care transitions using um, Eric Coleman's model of managing care transitions, which works very well, but um, has been supported only, again, as a very rigid, very specific model when, in fact, other people who, for whatever reason, uh, don't find that appropriate to their organization or their circumstances um, have been able to make a dent in uh, problems with transitions um, without it. But par And again, part of the problem of the Coleman model is there are five or six components. Nobody knows if you really have to have all five or six or if you do one or two, or if you can substitute numbers three and four um, for the other ones. So um, even though the word model slipped into the paper um, a few times um, in, the course of, uh, in the course of it, although maybe it was the copy editors at Health Affairs who stuck it in. Um, I'll blame it on them. But um, um, we talked about a dignity-driven decision-making um, as a strategy for improving care for people with advanced illness rather than as a model of care. Because in fact, we learned about dignity-driven decision-making by looking at a number of innovative programs, primarily on the West Coast, because that's where the SCAN Foundation is headquartered and where um, much of its um, um, energy um, is focused. Um, and no two of them were the same. Um, they were all different from one another in a number of important kinds of characteristics. I'll say a little bit about, more about that um, in a moment or two, but there obviously wasn't a single model on which we base things. Um, one last, I guess, sort of quasi-prefatory um, comment uh, before talking a little bit about what we think dignity-driven decision-making is um, or isn't, and that is that it's probably particularly um, inappropriate for someone who has been walking around promoting this particularly um, awkward and lengthy term of dignity-driven decision-making for two years to criticize the coalition to end unwanted medical treatment. Um, and we have been struggling for something uh, punchier and better um, subject to good acronyms um, for most of that period with, um, with a total absence of success. But I'll acknowledge it's not the most um, elegant um, of all terms. Um, <clears throat> again, we, um, uh, we studied and uh, looked at a number of uh, programs on the West Coast. Uh, we talked to people. We funded some additional work um, with some of them. We were also uh, benefited in our work from a learning collaborative um, of 35 or 40 uh, people, um, uh, mostly from the West Coast, predominantly clinicians engaged in innovative programs of uh, one kind or another, but including some um, 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 organizational managers and more senior people um, um, around, and um, um, a few ringers um, from the East Coast, like um, Andy McPherson and, and where Tommy just stuck out, he was afraid I was going to mention his name, but um, who've been um, <clears throat> meeting, talking to one another, uh, conference calling, uh, working on a listserv and so forth for about the last three years, and we learned a lot from them, um, as, um, as I'll show you in, um, in just another minute or so. But we were trying to understand what it is these people were doing that seemed to work so well and look so appealing to us. And... Um, and thinking about it in terms of some of the conventional um, discussions, and we 
they all talked about being patient-centered, but if you look at the literature on patient-centered care, it again talks a lot about these models of sort of rational decision-making in which um, the physician or the other clinician lays out for the patient or the patient and family what the options are, what the cost-benefit curves are, um, what the regression models show, um, and then the patient decides what he or she wants, and then the clinicians do that. Um, and that had nothing to do with the kind of uh, things we were seeing. There's a lot of talk, too, about patient-directed care, but I think that's really owned um, and perhaps appropriately by um, the mostly cognitively intact um, younger disabled who have um, really uh, built the model of, of patient-directed um, in-home care, long-term care, particularly uh, now serving um, several hundred thousand primarily Medicaid beneficiaries around the country um, in which the client um, not only um, makes decisions about um, the mix of services uh, he or she will receive, but directly uh, supervises and in many instances um, actually selects um, the hands-on um, caregivers. Um, we decided that, you know, some of the literature decided that, well, people should have control over their health care um, even when they're not actively patients. In fact, people with serious illnesses can choose not to be patients. Um, and um, so maybe instead of calling it patient-centered care, we really ought to call it personal, uh, person-centered care, particularly when you're talking about a predominantly older population um, that always has at least half a dozen chronic illnesses of one sort or another, uh, but none of which may be of immediate acute importance um, to that person. Um, and other aspects of their life may um, have much more direct contribution to their well-being or their perceived well-being at any sort of point um, in town. That's not your father's Oldsmobile either, just because I sort of like that phrase now that there are no Oldsmobiles um, anymore. Um, but the whole point we wanted to make about all these things is, again, they tended to fall into our instinctive stereotypical question in this society of who's in charge, uh, who makes the decisions, um, who gets the final say. Um, and I think always the patient or the patient's surrogate um, has to have the final say. But that's the wrong question. The real question is, what is the relationship between the patient and the patient's surrogates and advocates on the one hand and the caregivers um, on the other hand? That people who are most um, um, satisfied with the care they're receiving or the services they're receiving um, when they're experiencing advanced illnesses are the people who have a continuing relationship um, with a caregiver or a team of caregivers in which they feel it is not, perhaps no longer, perhaps never was necessary to explicitly talk about um, what choices uh, may be um, and what, um, what particular issues they may have to decide about. Um, as was um, described for us in, um, in a phrase in one of our conference calls with one of the members of our learning collaborative, a, a really a brilliant young um, oncologist and uh, health services researcher. She said, well, what we're really trying to get is to be the point where we can answer in the affirmative the question of whether we know you well enough to anticipate your needs and what you're worrying about and what your social limitations will be, whether we know you enough to help you where you actually are. Um, and I think that captures it as well as anything um, I've seen or heard about what we're trying to, to describe when we talk about dignity-directed decision-making. Our real insight to this came uh, when we had a series of focus groups um, about 18 months ago with patients and family members who were um, patients in some of the programs we thought as prototypes or exemplars of the kind of really high-quality care for people with advanced illness. And one of the questions in the interview guide that we asked um, uh, in, um, in every one of the four focus groups um, we had, or six focus groups, I missed two of them, four focus groups we had was, um, have you and your principal caregiver, after we had 
determine whether it was a physician or a nurse or a social worker or whomever. Have you talked about your plan of care? And almost unanimously, they had no idea what we were talking about. But when um, we talked to them about, um, has your clinician, your primary caregiver, ever suggested a treatment or an intervention or a change in your care that was not what you wanted, most of them said no. Um, you know, they said, yes, but I explained why, and that's never sort of come up again. Um, or, and again, um, this is what arises in sort of a continuing, everyone defined in most of our focus groups, the great majority of the patients defined um, their principal objective is remaining home throughout their illness. Although the system of formal long-term care in the parts of California in which we were located is so bad that they didn't realize they really didn't have any choice in that regard. But um, nonetheless, that was what they wanted and that was what was communicated to the caregivers and the caregiving team at a very early stage in one form or another. And then it was sort of just sort of taken for granted. And then they went from there talking about, what do you need today? How are you feeling today? Um, um, we changed your medication for this. How are you feeling with it? And so on and so forth. And the, the point is that it's not a, and it's, this is one of the problems with advanced directives, in my view. It's not a one-time decision. It's not a one-time set of questions. This is a continuing um, relationship um, over time. Um, in order to develop these kinds of relations and support these kind of relations, again, the organizations that we looked at or the care delivery programs um, that we looked at had to have certain other kinds of attributes in order to be able to sustain this kind of, um, this kind of support. Um, several of them were large um, health plans. Um, several others were large uh, multi-specialty group practices with a large number of enrollees. A couple of them were hospital-based systems. One of them was a, um, was a PACE program. Cheryl, I forgot you as a member of the collaborative. Um, <clears throat> but um, a former West Coaster now. So... Um, I got, I got category confusion, I'm sorry. But um, um, within the broader populations um, that they serve, um, every one of these organizations um, targeted particularly high need patients um, with advanced illnesses of one sort or another. In a few cases, it was sort of a bureaucratic reimbursement issue. We want to enroll these people in hospice um, and get paid for some of the hospice style services. Um, they need, but more often it was just a recognition. Resources are finite. Um, the kind of care we're talking about is requires more intensive management, and in many instances, more intensive uh, clinical time and clinical effort than that for other patients. And besides, people who aren't seriously ill um, often don't want to have that much interaction. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> with the healthcare system. They don't want such intensive involvements uh, with their caregivers um, of one kind or another. They'd rather not deal with it at all. So we have to have some formal mechanism generally for identifying who's going um, to be the uh, beneficiary um, of all these um, of all these services. Um, we try to say 24-7 access to somebody who had access to a patient's a medical record or at least was related to a team of clinicians who knew the patient. There are fewer of the smaller programs that relied on um, answering services, thank you, um, or other coverage arrangements and didn't literally have 24-7, so we talked about assured expedited access. But people, and particularly people who are on the edge clinically who can fall into crisis um, very, very quickly, and particularly because the big benefit from the patient's point of view and from the financial point of view of these programs comes down to avoiding trips to the emergency room, um, finding somebody who is knowledgeable, whether they have personal knowledge um, about the patient and her condition um, around the clock is really critical to uh, being successful. Um, with these programs. Um, it helps a lot to have structured care processes and case management um, in part to ensure that the communications and records are such that whoever picks up the phone um, when they're covering on Saturday at 4 o'clock um, has some knowledge 
of um, the person's caregivers, has some access to the parent, patient, the patient's record and um, some of the history associated with the patient um, and so forth. These services tend to be very much um, based um, in the home. Um, they rely much more heavily than most of the medical system does on um, community-based services outside the formal ambit of medical care. And one of the most interesting phenomena to me, sort of almost as a sidelight of some of the changes that have been going on um, in, as a result of the ACA and related developments over the last two or three years <clears throat> is all of these um, hospital-based people discovering that there's a whole world of community-based services for the elderly out there that they sort of vaguely knew existed because they met it, read about it in the newspaper, um, but never had any interaction with or at least any um, sort of clinical interaction with and actually introducing themselves to people and um, getting to know their phone numbers. It's really quite a, I actually, in 1982, um, at, at my um, suggestion, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation spent about 20-some million dollars, which in 1982 was a large amount of money, and something we call hospital initiatives in long-term care to try to build those relationships. Um, and it was 30-some um, years before its time and almost, um, almost total failure, so I get a particular sense of reward then. Not that they're actually working with one another, but they're meeting one another, um, and they're exchanging business cards. So this is a, actually a major um, breakthrough. The other thing <coughs> that we've been spending a lot of time at, and we have an absolutely enthralling paper, um, another paper coming out that the Scampo Foundation is going to publish itself, because it's really not quite academic and it's not quite um, policy, and it's is if you think, if you're really committed to the notion that individuals, to the, to the extent they're cognitively um, capable, and their caregivers to the extent they need help with dealing with cognitively complex issues or with communicating, um, should have some real control over the kinds of services they receive and the kinds of medical care they receive, then figuring out the extent to which they feel they have that control um, and um, further figuring out the extent to which they feel that they are being well served by the people who are providing them with care is in fact a principal outcome measure. It's not sort of an intermediate measure or a facilitative measure. None of these folks are going to be cured. Um, none of these folks are going to have clinical outcomes that anybody is happy with at the end of the day. They're all going to die somewhat uh, more uh, quickly or very much more quickly than other people of their um, age and socioeconomic status. The real question is, um, are they um, in a relationship that permits them to manage that process with as much a sense of, of control, of dignity, of autonomy, as much of an absence as is possible of anxiety and fear um, as possible. And frankly, our paper came about when we learned that um, Rand had a contract from CMS to modify HEDIS uh, for hospice patients. Um, and after um, I stopped screaming, I decided we needed to do something else about it because, in fact, most of our quality measurement tools these days, including most of our tools um, trying to get at questions of patient satisfaction, don't come anywhere close to addressing the kind of issues that are most important um, to people with advanced illness and most important to them in terms of their relationship with the care delivery system. And so we don't have a solution to that at all, but we have um, some things to say and some suggestions about how we could learn a lot more um, about how to do that better than we're going to, I fear, in the world of value-based purchasing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, <clears throat> um, so why isn't everybody doing it? Well, the reason, if you talk to people providing this kind of care um, in a way that's exemplary, the first thing they always say um, is that, you know, Medicare won't pay for it. Um, or Medicare won't cover it. Um, I've never heard people say that before um, about anything I ever encountered. Um, and in fact, I think, not having been trained as a clinician myself, I think that it's probably part of the new competency-based residency exams that um, when 
um, when physicians are trained when um, anything sort of um, they failed to do anything they were supposed to um, and the question is why did you fail to do that well Medicare won't pay for it I mean that's certainly part we don't license healthcare administrators you know except for nursing home administrators which is a very sore subject among nursing home administrators but I think it's part of the finals for every MPH and MBA program in health administration as well why is <clears throat> there um, why is there a terrible shortage on the West Coast of the Wheatina that my father-in-law loves because well, Medicare won't pay for it, obviously. And um, so that's the, um, um, that's the reflex um, in all of these things. But to some extent, um, they have a point in the sense that um, um, the kind of services that are provided in these programs are, uh, require much more intensive primary care management and care management than the fee-for-service system generally uh, pays for, although we're experimenting with new ways um, of doing that. In fact, we didn't want to give away the whole thing and give other people all the credit for the work we've done. They look a lot what primary care medical homes are supposed to do um, in, in a variety of ways, although um, very few places that the NCQA is certified as primary care medical homes really do all of them. But, um, um, and the lesson there is that one of our, actually two of our sites were particularly instructive in the sense that they served large numbers uh, both of fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries and Medicare beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans um, in a couple of instances plans that were actually controlled by the providers in a couple of instances, uh, plans where there was uh, a willingness to subcapitate the providers. Um, and they made lots of money on their capitated patients who were enrolled in these programs and lost money, not a whole lot of money, but they lost some money um, on their uh, fee-for-service um, uh, patients. Um, and so that's been a barrier. A bigger barrier is that most healthcare professionals don't know how to do this kind of thing. Um, and um, there's an enormous gap in education and experience. Um, there's now a growing amount of literature. At least once a month there's an article about uh, well, you don't teach residents to talk to people and so forth in the New England Journal and every issue of academic medicine. Um, but it's, it's, a real, um, it's a real gap. And then you do need the whole set of organizational infrastructure just like you need it to run an ACO or to um, operate a primary care medical home of which the IT infrastructure is um, the most expensive, the most visible, and the one with the greatest gap between um, expectations or specifications and actual um, actual performance. Um, you also need an organization that's really committed to doing this, um, that is really committed to investing in these kinds of services and in a way investing um, its patients. And particularly for big medical centers or big physician groups, um, they have to balance their commitment to these kinds of programs and the investment and the cost and the hassle of running these programs over time with cultures that have really been very much oriented towards cure, towards um, making ever faster and more precise technologically intensive innovations to not necessarily developing relationships with patients because that's too time consuming, um, to increasing throughput um, in um, it's like the whole world was run by surgeons. Um, and um, so um, there needs to be a very basic kind of, in order to maintain the organizational commitment to the extra training, to the more selective recruiting, um, to changes in the reward system to support people who spend an extra two or three hours, um, to the nurses who give patients their personal cell phone numbers so that they have 24-7 access and so forth. And there's still not a whole lot of healthcare organizations um, that care enough or think it's important enough. Um, in order to make um, those kinds of uh, commitments. Um, it's very hard work to do this, and in order to maintain it and operate it over a period of time, you need not only to recruit people who are committed to it and interested in doing it and know how to do it, but you've got to support them um, over time, and that's 
continuing investment. <clears throat> Having said that, um, if you do all this, um, you reduce inpatient hospital use, although all the numbers are preliminary and they're limited and they're from a small number, and this is not you know, scientific. But it's really a little bit worrisome because what they mostly do is reduce terminal hospitalizations. That is to say, people in these programs die at home. Um, and they're not hospitalized in the last six months of life uh, for something um, that if they get hospitalized for, it maybe won't kill them, but if they get treated at home, maybe it will kill them. Because they've said, <clears throat> I don't want to go to the hospital. If I die at home, I'll die at home. Um, and so um, acute respiratory issues, acute exacerbations of congestive heart failure, those sorts of things. The people don't get hospitalized. Those hospitalizations tend to be very expensive. Um, once they're in the hospital, the services, um, it's not so much of, you know, all the extra services of being kept alive, because these are people who are very clear they don't want all of those things. What it is is the expense associated with the hospitalization and the transport itself. And the other big, enormous... Um, savings, again, is reduced emergency room um, utilization um, and reduced visits to the emergency room. And, you know, in a way, again, there's a lesson here for the entire health care system because um, it's not just older people with advanced illness who go to the emergency room because they're having some kind of serious symptoms at um, 11 o'clock at night or on a Saturday and uh, need to know if it's serious or not um, and can't find any other way to get somebody to pay attention to. Every one of you who's ever been the parent of a baby knows that those instances happen all the time um, as well. And um, good pediatric primary care medical homes have somebody on the other end of the phone. And there are a lot fewer emergency visits for those families um, as well, but those cost a lot of money. And for older people who are frail and have complex advanced illness, the actual expense of the emergency room visit itself is only a part of the costs of um, the anxiety of the deterioration and commissions of the way the emergency room physicians doing their jobs will totally mess up and undo the work that the um, the patient's regular physicians and nurses have been doing, and then God help us, the patient gets admitted or even worse, spends um, uh, one day and 23 hours as an observation patient, um, and by the time they get back home, they're really a total wreck. Um, and their condition is much worse off than before the onset of whatever the condition was um, that took them uh, to the emergency room. And again, <clears throat> the issue here is those programs that are dealing with fee-for-service patients, um, by avoiding these emergency room visits and by avoiding these terminal hospitalizations, are saving Medicare a lot of money, um, but um, they're not getting to see any of it, which even if it's not they're not losing money on those patients, the fact that somebody else is making a lot of money on those patients really upsets them. Um, and they want to figure out how to get their share. Or they can say, the hell with you, I'm not going to do it because you don't pay me extra for it. Um, what do we need to do um, in order to see more of this and to expand these kinds of programs? Again, they're not going to expand under the fee-for-service model, even if, and we spent a lot of time and a lot of work trying to figure out ways to sort of help uh, providers who live in a fee-for-service environment make a go of it with these programs. Um, and the only way they can do it, um, and we're working on one particular example at the moment, is by subcontracting decapitated providers um, for care of the very high need um, and um, patients and taking a shared savings or subcapitated amount. This may be actually... Um, a particularly good population, assuming the, um, CMS could ever get the risk adjustment models right, and assuming they could ever get the data to the ACOs in a timely enough fashion, this could be a really good population for a shared savings kind of payment model. Um, because you really, people don't, really don't want to lock in. It's one of the reasons people don't enroll in hospice too late. It's an acknowledgement of irreversibility. It's an acknowledgement they don't want to get better. Your dignity-driven decision-making ACO is going to have the same problem. PACE programs sort of have the same problem. Um, on the other hand, um, 
um, not only shared savings models, but um, whether or not these programs work well from a financial point of view, from a managerial point of view, for fully capitated plans also depends on the extent to which risk adjustment mechanisms adequately reflect um, the needs of these patients. And that's really hard because when you have symptom-driven risk adjustment models and good community-based care prolongs life um, and may prevent exacerbation of some of the uh, symptoms, um, your existing formulas may not um, work um, all that well. Um, the other thing we need, and again, I already mentioned it, but I think it's really critical, we really need um, appropriate outcome and quality measures. And we need them um, because it's the right thing to do. We also need it, frankly, because um, this is not, um, and I was talking to someone last week about it, the, the sort of death panel allegations um, are not a passing thing. They're not a one-time phenomenon of the Tea Party in 2010. We dealt with them in 96 and 97. The whole reason the abomination of so-called private fee-for-service plans were part of Medicare Plus Choice was a conviction on the part of some of the same communities and some of the same people that the whole Medicare advantage, or what was then the whole Medicare managed care program, was a government plot to euthanize all the elderly as a way of saving uh, the government money and Medicare money. And their response to it was that particular one at the time. But the fact is, if you say we can identify <clears throat> a part of the population where, which is just as happy if in the last six months of life they forego intentional um, um, interventional medical treatment. And in doing that, we can save um, Medicare a lot of money. Um, people are going to be suspicious. Um, and I'm not entirely sure they're wrong to be suspicious. And I'm not entirely clear that we can Oh, that in the 20 years the Medicare hospice benefit has um, existed, it saved Medicare um, more than a nickel or two. So that may be part of the problems of the benefit and the way in which it's administered and so on and so forth. But if our principle is, if our goal is to say, we want to make sure we are giving people what they want. There is a fundamental human right and an issue of fundamental human dignity when people have advanced illness of being able to get the care they want determined by their needs and their wishes as well as by uh, clinicians, then we got to damn well be able to prove it in significant detail um, in an intellectually and statistically robust kind of way. And um, until we have the ability to do that, um, our anecdotes are always going to get countered by their anecdotes. Um, and um, this is a place where, um, um, where measurement really, I think, makes a difference. And it's really hard. Um, and it's going to take a while. And of course, nobody wants to wait that long. Um, you also need organizations that really want to do this, which is hard, and then we need, um, we have a whole um, uh, generation of clinicians um, who we have to train and we have to recruit, we have to keep in the business, we have to support them, um, and, um, and so forth. And I will just finish um, with this one um, um, illustration. Um, from real life, and I hope she'll forgive me because I didn't ask her permission, um, of using the illustration. Um, about three years ago, um, two and a half, my mother-in-law had um, replacement of a heart valve um, at um, a hospital associated with the sponsors of one of our prototypical programs um, on the West Coast, and she was 80 four years old at the time, um, although otherwise in generally good health. And um, um, there were some post-operative complications, as is not uncommon, including um, a minor stroke and so forth. But um, the operation was a success. Um, and in fact, I can say two and a half years later, she's doing extremely well. And um, both her uh, neurological and cardiological health are um, excellent, but she was um, discharged from the hospital, this being California, about four or five days after the surgery, even having had the um, intraoperative stroke in the process, um, and was sent home. And while it never occurred to the surgeon, 
Um, fortunately, my wife um, yelled and screamed at enough people so that home care services were arranged. And uh, two or three days after she came home, um, later than uh, was appropriate, but eventually a nurse showed up, again, from a home care agency owned by the same health care system with this uh, model program. And the nurse showed up. She introduced herself to my mother-in-law and said, um, we have a number of things to talk about. First, um, I have an advanced directive form I need you to fill out. Um, um, that was um, a total um, calamity. But that is happening every day in homes of Medicare beneficiaries who are not terminally ill, as um, my mother-in-law was not, um, all over the country. Um, and um, partially that's a misunderstanding of bureaucratic requirements. Partially it's a really crummy home care agency. Um, but largely, it's a question of training, educating, supervising a whole generation of healthcare professionals in how to do this kind of stuff. Um, and until we can change payment all we want, but uh, we can change policies um, all we want, we can educate the public all we want, but until we have professionals who can deliver these services in a way consistent uh, with these models and these goals, uh, we're going to be pushing the rock um, up the hill. Um, I've already talked for longer than I was supposed to after showing up late. I apologize for that, but um, if people have any questions or comments, I'm happy to try to respond. Yeah. Hi, I'm Judy Hey, Judy, how are you? Good. Hiding behind there. Sorry. Um, yeah, you're not hi. old enough to say that, but it's okay. I think we're all aging in place together. Um, and in that regard, thank you for your good work and thank you for trying to bridge what the acute care world knows of the other side of the world. What I did notice is um, when you were talking about integrated systems and PACE as groups that can pull this off, the growing movement of palliative care has also been shown to start with some of the reduced hospitalizations and knows how to have these kinds of iterative, dignity-driven conversations with people. So and I think that would be a we good We spent addition. a lot of time about the relationship between dignity-driven decision-making and palliative care and between palliative, palliative care and hospice care. And I, there's, it's a whole other, like, ultimately fruitless six-hour discussion there. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the principles of palliative care, uh, primarily in terms of care planning and symptoms management, um, are principles that have to be part of any um, DDDM-based program. But I would argue, and it's one of my continuous fights with Diane Meyer and people like that, I would argue are characteristics of good clinical care of anyone. And, uh, part of the problem with palliative care and expanding the availability of palliative care and so forth, and particularly of getting um, physicians and hospitals to organize, to order palliative care consults, is the boundary between palliative care and good clinical care is still not clear enough in lots of different instances. So in a way, you're entirely right. In a way, I'm not sure how far further down the road um, that gets us because all of these programs were providing care consistent with the principles of palliative care, but they were doing lots of other things as well, and they wouldn't define themselves as being involved in palliative care. So, yeah. So, I'm Lena Wynn, and I'm a physician and medical educator. And I, and I want to say um, first thank you for the excellent talk, but also I totally agree with you with regard to lack of training and the better job that, that all of us have to do with, 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 with the clinicians to train them on these sensitive issues. Um, what I'm wondering is how do you balance this with the limited time and the increasingly limited time that, 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 that clinicians have in doctor's visits, especially with the pressures to see more patients, but also with increased pressures to do medical records. I mean, already our patients talk about how there's this computer between them and their patients, right, and all these check boxes that we have to do. Well, so I, can, can reimbursement change, or is there a way to get non-clinicians to also help with this process? You know, um, I would feel a little awkward about redefining every question in terms of personal experience, except if you read the introduction to Hobbes's Leviathan, which is the seminal work of 
Western political science, he talks about the superior methodology of the social sciences being introspection. So, but, um, but again, having been to the dentist yesterday has really has the lesson because they figured out, and the answer is spending 15 minutes on a patient visit, 20 minutes with a patient visit is impossible for a physician dealing with a patient with serious advanced illness, even if the patient's there every month, to do everything they need to do in those visits. On the other hand, the notion that you spend the same 20 minutes with every patient in a mixed practice is loony. Um, it's, you know, and um, again, 90%, I think, the average, of what happens during a primary care visit in the typical pediatric or adult medicine um, setting can be done by someone who's not a physician. And I have had visits to my physicians, my wife has had visits to her physicians, when we were at the office for an hour and we spent three minutes with the physician and that was fine because everything the physician had to do, the physician did. And we had an a relationship in those instances in which once upon a time we had spent half an hour together and so that was I mean I had a ophthalmologist visit last Friday I was there for an hour and 15 minutes I spent five minutes with the ophthalmologist and I mean it was I got a good report so it was fine but um, so I think we have um, I hate to put it in all these sort of technocratic terms and everything but and this is true of my primary care physician who I love to death, the notion that it makes sense to organize the day of an office-based primary care provider or any specialty in equal size blocks is just obsolete. And the notion that a lot of what occurs and, and now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, you know, a nurse practitioner should do the physical exam or all that kind of stuff, but there's a lot of stuff you can do if you organize um, physician practices uh, the way the most sophisticated places are doing rather than the way most places are. Now there's a problem with that and the problem with that you can't do that if you were a practice that's one or two physicians. It just doesn't work and, um, and what we've been dishonest I think in communicating with people we've been trying to recruit to be primary care physicians is not saying you can't make a living I mean, that is true, but what Stasanis is saying, you can't make a living if you want to be in a solo or two-person or three-person practice. Um, it's also why we've been so busy bailing out all these rural hospitals, we've got to figure out a way to bail out rural physicians because there aren't enough people in a lot of those counties to have more than one or two physicians. But um, there, you can't run an economically rational, clinically rational physician practice with just a couple people anymore. And um, that's probably, uh, that's too bad in some ways, but, um, you know, and that's not an artifact of the, all the stupidities of the American system. I think that's recognized increasingly everywhere in the world, so. Um, all the way in back. <laughs> Hi, uh, Charlie Sabatino, the ABA Commission on, on Law and Aging. There, there's an increasing number of uh, decision aids for advanced care planning that are popping up out there, only a few of which have been, you know, studied with any rigor. But uh, it, how much do you see that as playing a role in these dignity-driven models in the future? Uh, and, you know, and it could become very technological. We could have a Dr. Yeah, I, I've Sir, spent Dr. Uh, one, on her phone. one of the people who could not attend this session is an entrepreneur based in Dallas who has a web-based, cloud-based app for advanced care planning. And I probably spent two hours on the phone with him in the last three weeks. And he's a very nice, very sincere guy. And um, again, I won't talk about my own experience in this. The problem with advanced care planning is that almost no one can imagine what it actually feels like when you're really very sick. And, um, and we delude ourselves, fortunately, otherwise we'd all be having anxiety attacks every seven minutes about um, what it means to be terminally ill, frankly. And once people get in that situation, people have no way of anticipating. So there's a subset of the population 
I sort of think of as the same people who buy Hondas, um, who love to do this kind of stuff. I mean, they're all the people who do the life insurance calculators. And if they want to fill out advanced directives, uh, sorry, more power to them. I mean, I think that's great. And they ought to do those that are legally sound um, and legally viable and so on and so forth. And the interesting question is when the day comes where some clinician or a family member has to look at the advanced directive and follow it, will that have any relationship to what the issues are that clinician and that patient are dealing with at that time? And I think maybe, maybe not, I, even with pulsed. I mean, there are only eight or nine separate kinds of contingencies that are anticipated for in the bulk. And um, it's now maybe, I mean, some of the best literature seen on this subject actually tries to educate people a little bit about what the experience is like being in an intensive care unit, what it means like to be intubated. But who wants to read that stuff? I mean, who wants to think about that stuff? So. Um, again, I, I'll, I have to, I can't do anything but talking about my personal experiences. When the lawyer who updated our will and my wife insisted that I finally do a health care proxy, I named my wife as my proxy, I named my oldest child, and I sat down, my wife and my kids, and said, I have no idea what's going to happen that causes and how I'll feel or what I want. I trust you guys. I love you guys. You know me better than anyone else in the world. You do what you think is right. That's the only instruction I can give you. And I think if people had the issue framed for them in those terms, um, many, I would, wouldn't be the only person who felt that way. So maybe instead of talking about advanced directors or pulse, maybe we have to talk about is really thinking what we mean by surrogacy and surrogate decision making, really clarifying the law on some of that and really educating the public on some of that. Because that's what it comes down to, um, to the extent that anyone other than a doctor is making the decision. Nine times out of 10, even when people have advanced directives, that's what it comes down to. And um, so I would, um, I would focus my efforts there more than on patient determined advanced directives because by there, I mean, I, there are so many instances I've seen in which by the time the patient is in the situation requiring an advanced directive, what they wanted, thought, knew, believed when they filled out the form is, not, is out the window. How much time? Yeah, right. Bob Griss with yeah, the I'm Institute of Social Medicine and Community Health. Could you say a few words about social programming and meaningful social programming to people with chronic and advanced medical conditions and how, how to regulate that in a medical facility. Do, do we know enough from hospice and from, from uh, nursing home care that we can do a better job of ensuring that medical facilities pay sufficient attention to these social programming needs that people have when they're preoccupied with their medical conditions and not with what's meaningful in their lives? Well, I would argue, I mean, you know, hospice is not a facility-based service by and large. I would argue that nursing homes probably do a better job of trying to pay attention to some of those issues than, um, than is done on behalf of isolated people getting home and community-based services in, in many, many instances. And, um, Again, given the growing proportion of all nursing home residents who are uh, significantly cognitively impaired in one way or another, it's sort of less and less relevant. But um, th there is, I mean, it's a whole other story, and our enthusiasm for moving everybody with um, advanced illness out of institutions into home and community-based settings which is basically a good thing, but we've forgotten to pay any attention to what actually goes on in those settings. And um, a lot of people are uh, sort of very isolated, very cut off from um, sources, uh, potential sources of satisfaction in their life. That's going to get worse over time as the proportion of people in their 80s and 90s with serious illnesses who have living children continues to shrink. Um, and um, so, 
but I would worry about it. And we have a lot more today. There are a whole lot more cognitively intact people receiving home community-based care than there are receiving institutionally-based care. So I would worry more about that um, over time than, uh, than about the institutions. One last one, and this poor woman's kept her arm up the whole time, so. Can you use the uh, mic, please? I'm Samantha Crane from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, and I'm also on the board of Not Dead Yet, uh, the organization that promotes um, access to medical, life-saving medical care for people with disabilities. And I just wanted to say I really appreciated your story about your mother um, who was asked to sign an advanced directive in order to receive home care. And we see a lot of people with chronic disabilities who are, um, will f often face a situation where they're asked to sign a do not resuscitate or they're not informed of more aggressive treatment options for temporary um, illnesses or might even be sort of advised not to seek aggressive treatment that they want. And I was wondering if the move to capitated care or the sort of emphasis on we're going to save on hospitalizations might, um, you know, how is this going to affect people with high, high medical needs who might want to continue aggressive? You know, that's a very, very good question. It's back to the question of unwanted medical treatment. I'm old enough to remember when. Um, uh, leukemia patients over the age of 65 were not offered bone marrow transplants because they were too old to get bone marrow transplants. Um, and um, um, I remember personally worrying um, a great deal in the mid-90s about the explosive growth in the number of um, knee replacements being done on Medicare beneficiaries and wondering if that was really an appropriate way to spend money and until I got to know some people in their 70s and 80s who had, uh, were in enormous pain and then got their knees replaced and um, after the PT the pain pretty much went away and so yeah I think we still do and I think it's part of this whole um, death panel concern I think we too tend to stereotype um, and uh, create a variety of expectations that people past a certain stage, whether it's an age stage or a disability stage, won't benefit from or don't need or won't sufficiently benefit from some kind of curative intervention, intervention treatment, and they get denied it without ever being asked whether or not they want it, even when clinically it would be just fine. And um, um, I think that is, um, that is a continuing um, problem, um, and um, it's interesting because, and it's to me one of the great sort of mysteries of health policy at the moment are all these questions. If you look at um, what we all think of generally appropriately as the more humane universal health care systems in Northern Europe, for example, which um, 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 have older populations than we do in the United States. Um, in fact, um, and all of which have much higher utilization of physician visits, of office visits, of other kinds of services, prescription drugs and so forth, than we do. But they don't do, I mean, the British are sort of the stereotype of this, but they don't do as many elective hips um, or as elective valves or whatever on people in their 80s as we do in the United States. And um, the question, but if you say, are you rationing, you're rationing these services, they'll deny it because there is no um, explicit rationing in most of those countries. And if you look at the history of people over 65 in Britain not going on dialysis, it was a big scandal. And every, every nephrologist in Britain denied that they were denied um, dialysis, people over 65. People over 65 just, they said, didn't expect to get dialysis. Well, that was partially because their doctors weren't telling them to get it. But, um, of course, we're dialyzing in the United States a lot of terminally ill 90-year-olds, which is a scandal of its own. But, um, so, um, and I don't, but I don't really know what's what kind of implicit rationing and what kind of social rationing. But th there really is an expectation, an issue of expectations 
and an issue of what cultural mores about what's appropriate and what isn't. And part of the issue in the United States, yeah, we overtreat people, yeah, they're avaricious physicians, but part of the issue as well is, um, and it's less, in my experience, the patients themselves and their kids. We have convinced people that if only they find the right doctor at the right medical center, they can cure anything. Um, and um, that's not the case. And so the interplay of these, all of these issues, that would be a great subject for one of your future lunches if there's, you find somebody who knows what he's talking about, of sort of the interaction between social expectations, how clinicians react to them or share in them, and how that affects the care people get or don't get, I think is a really interesting, really hard question. So, good place to end. Thank you. Thank you for, for braving Amtrak and coming down and stimulating us over our lunch with such provocative and interesting thoughts. Um, we will have another of these lunches, and so uh, keep your eyes peeled. Are there any other final parting words I need to give other than don't slip on the ice? <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>